job, Maggie. Um, let me just uh, get set up here. So I was thinking that uh, perhaps as we're awaiting for the uh, fringes of the tropical storm to come on a cloudy Friday afternoon, uh, maybe it's not a, such a bad thing to uh, have a webinar at this time on this particular project. Some of you heard me uh, talk on June 12th in the Scranton Area Foundation uh, webinar on the psychology of return to work. Uh, and at that point, at that uh, presentation, I alluded to the Resilience Project, and I'm going to tell you uh, more about it. So yes, as uh, Maggie said, one of the questions is, can Scranton NEPA become a community of resilience? And the second uh, part of the question is, can adversity, COVID-19, social unrest, economic disruption, be an opportunity to drive fundamental change? And I have an ambitious outline today that I'm going to try to cover in the time that we have. I'm going to give you some background on health and healthcare, uh, where things are, uh, where things are in this particular region. Uh, some of you have seen some of these slides uh, because I gave part of this talk uh, at Marywood last year and uh, alluded to some of this information uh, on June 12th. I'm going to also talk about population health and adversity. I'm going to define what is resilience tell you a little bit about the Resilience Project, how we conceptualize resilience, say something about resilience science, resilience promotion, and uh, how might we advance resilience in Northeastern Pennsylvania, and why is that important? So consider the following. Approximately a third of the three plus trillion dollars in US healthcare cost is waste. Uh, that's from a 2012 article by Don Berwick um, and a collaborator, Hackbarth. Uh, Berwick, as you may know, uh, was a candidate for heading the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and uh, the Congress uh, voted against his uh, appointment there um, because he was talking about admiring the British healthcare system. So he never got that position, so he went back to Harvard where he has continued to be uh, productive and uh, a major voice in the reform of US healthcare. Now, overall health system performance among states. Now, these data come from the Commonwealth Fund and the Commonwealth Fund does this survey every few years where they, they took, take a look at the states and uh, you'll, as you'll see in a moment, they zero, zero in on 300 plus uh, communities around the country. So on the left-hand side are the states with better performance. Uh, the top state, and this is from uh, 2018, is, is uh, Hawaii, followed by Massachusetts, Minnesota, Vermont, uh, and so forth. The bottom states, below the US average, but really at the tail end, um, Florida, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Mississippi. And if we had a, a dialogue, open dialogue going in, I would ask you, well, what's the difference between those states and the states at, on the other side of, uh, of this uh, picture? Uh, but that's for another discussion, I guess. Now, the Commonwealth Fund, uh, here are the, the top um, communities in the country in terms of healthcare overall performance access to healthcare, prevention and treatment, avoidable hospital use and cost, and uh, kind of a public health perspective on healthy lives. And Honolulu uh, kind of rates uh, at the top of the heap, uh, followed by uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, areas in California and Minnesota again. Um, and you really want to have your community be in the light green uh, uh, color now, the next slide will show you the bottom group. And I don't think you want to have your health care provided in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Oxford, Mississippi. Um, those are, these are the uh, communities at the bottom of this list of uh, communities that have been studied by the Commonwealth Fund, which, by the way, is an apolitical group that does this kind of broad scale population health uh, perspective. 
And, I, and for interest, local interest, I pulled out the top 10 uh, communities, which are on the left, Honolulu through Dubuque, Iowa, and the bottom 10, beginning with Munster, Indiana, and the bottom Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And then I pulled out the communities, all the communities uh, evaluated by the Commonwealth Fund in Pennsylvania. Uh, the best uh, community in Pennsylvania, as, as rated by the Commonwealth Fund, is York, Pennsylvania, followed by Lancaster. And you can see that at the bottom of the community studied by the Commonwealth Fund, Scranton rates, uh, ranks 151st and Wilkes-Barre ranks 166th. Now, I'm going to kind of be weaving in various concepts and themes throughout this talk. It's humbling to me as a physician that only 20% of health is determined by health care. The rest is determined by social determinants of health. So some old data has suggested that your zip code is as important as your genetic code. And that's a complex story that probably a number of you know about. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of that, but this is uh, something for us to be aware of. Health and health care are really kind of, they're related, but, but they're also uh, separate entities. Now, adversity. You know, from the National Comorbidity Study, about 25 to 30 percent of people exposed to significant traumatic events will develop PTSD with a lifetime prevalence of about 8 to 9 percent. But that means that 70 to 75 percent of this population does not. So we're interested in what are the characteristics of those individuals who remain functional and intact? Now, some other data that suggest the limitations of uh, some of the, uh, the processes of care that we're involved in. One in five Americans will uh, struggle from major depression in their lifetime, and approved treatments are ineffective in 30 to 50 percent. So this high rate of treatment resistance suggests that there are prominent mechanisms that are unresolved by current treatment approaches. We also know that childhood adversity robustly predicts psychopathology and refers to negative experiences that deviate from the expectable environment and require meaningful adaptation by an individual. So some of you are familiar with the concept of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences that was, uh, uh, came out of uh, a study at Kaiser in San Diego. Um, and so they developed a checklist. And if you have so many events in your life, they're saying it, they kind of pose that you are particularly at risk the more adverse traumatic events that you have. So although childhood adversity is a powerful predictor of psychopathology, this relationship is not deterministic. In other words, that one may have uh, childhood adversity, but it's not necessarily the case that one goes on and develops post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. And in fact, recent literature is suggesting that, well, there can be recall bias and other factors that make the reporting of childhood traumatic events uh, questionable in the histories of some individuals. So, Many individuals who have encountered severe forms of, of adversity demonstrate resilience and don't go on to develop problems. And so this gets into the concept of, well, what is resilience? So resilience involves processes that protect people from risk from these uh, negative consequences. So does this mean that we should start to focus on factors to protect or mitigate downstream consequences of various impingements on individuals and communities. Healthcare searches for what's wrong, that is pathology, and the goal is to fix it. Resilience is about strength and protection, with the goal being to learn how these attributes exist in individuals and communities and take steps to enhance resilience in whatever ways 
that are necessary. And that's basically um, what it is that we're interested in, in terms of uh, the resilience project. So I've already kind of alluded to how we conceptualize resilience. It's the ability to bend but not break, to be able to bounce back. And what makes one individual or one community more resilient than another? Why do some succumb to stressful events while others, when exposed to the same stressors, emerge relatively intact? and maybe even grow in the face of adversity. So the project itself, and this is just an outline, the first part is proof of concept. So what is resilience? I've already kind of gotten into that. You know, does it matter? Does it make a difference? What are the components of resilience? And we're really interested in integrating the psychosocial and neurobiological factors to define resilience. What is the relationship between individual resilience and community resilience? Can resilience be improved at both individual and community levels? And if resilience can be improved, what are the implications for individuals and communities? What are the implications for health, for socioeconomic improvement, for quality of life? The second part, is can Scranton and Northeastern Pennsylvania become a community of resilience? Is this desirable? Is that possible? What would that mean? What works against this possibility? What is the effect of corruption on individuals and communities? I, I've alluded to this statement previously in previous talks about um, is there community pride? Can there be community pride when there is a pervasive or historical pervasiveness of corruption. Um, and I think that there are down consequences when one lives in an atmosphere where it's well known that a corrupt system is, uh, is uh, in charge of a particular community. What determines that? Is it still about coal and being hard scrabbled, rugged individuals? We call this the electric city a term that was applied a long time ago. But when I think of electric city, I think of Tesla, I think of lithium ion batteries. Why are there truck routes through the middle of cities and towns? Where are the in-town green spaces? And there are some new models that have been developing. Integrated grocery pharmacy health clinics, for example. So these are a few of the things that I'm going to allude to uh, in this talk further on. Now, part three is a specific proposal on resilient science and academia. This is not a two, three, or five-year project uh, where we're looking for funding. We are modeling this, Scranton, Northeastern Pennsylvania, similar to what happened with the Framingham Heart Study in Massachusetts, which now is, is over 70 years old. And last year they received, a, uh, I think, a $32 million grant uh, to study the effects of cardio cardiovascular illness in older individuals. So I, I'm going to kind of, kind of tickle the audience here by saying, is this possible for Scranton NEPA to become identified as a community of resilience. So what are some of the components of resilience? Well, there are environmental ones, some of which I've alluded to, living conditions, socioeconomic status, the support and resources that are available, uh, individual diet, uh, access to uh, healthy foods, education level, habits, and the nature of a community. And then psychosocial issues, which are individualized, self-esteem, spirituality, communication skills, connectedness, self-opinion, and adaptability. And then physical issues, such as genetics, health, and cognition. So if we were to give a resilience survey to a population of individuals and communities, some would score high, some low, and some in the middle. What characterizes each group? How do we go about answering this question? We believe that res resilience can not only be sustained, but improved. Now, 
there's been a lot of interest in the concept of resilience and various groups have been identifying what they consider resilient communities. And so, so here are uh, resilient, vibrant communities. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about vibrancy and how that fits into the resilience concept. The, this list focuses primarily on urban development. So Nashville, Southwest Baltimore, Oklahoma City, and the others listed there are considered resilient cities. And in, in the uh, June 12th talk, I talked about the Rockefeller Foundation uh, identifying 100 resilient cities across the world with the goal being, I think by 2025, identifying a thousand cities that they could uh, characterize as being resilient cities. So resilience mitigates adversity and can be inherent to communities uh, that protect and enhance communities. Community resilience is all about connection and linking people that goes beyond infrastructure. It fosters successful connectivity in urban planning. It accounts for transportation times, access to green spaces, cultural institutions, and social engagement, housing, health, wellness, retail design, community centers, vibrant streetscapes are all components. And this moves into the concept of vibrancy. Resilience is protective. Vibrancy is what makes a community interesting and is the attribute that would draw people to a community. So it's the resilience of individuals interacting with their environments through relevant institutions, government, community groups, that gives a community resilience. And here, I just kind of threw out a bunch of areas for consideration that I think would need to be linked to, pro to pro promote resilience. And as you can see, this is a, there's, there are probably other things that could be added and should be added to this, this uh, abstract. Um, but it, it really touches on many of the things that are essential to consider in promoting and developing concepts of resilience in communities. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And then there's the issue of resilient science and academia. And is this a new field of study? And some background on resilience assessment and research. So resilience concepts have been around for a long time and social sciences scientists have described what are believed to be associated with what makes one resilient. And so there have been descriptors applied such as self-value, self-regulation, problem-solving ability, supportive beliefs, social support, from family, friends, school, job, and community. These activities are frequently cited as characterizing individual resilience. And at the same time, neuroscience has been trying to understand the neurobiological mechanisms in animal models that might relate to resilience in humans to determine if there are approaches to modifying an individual's resilience capacity, that is, interventions that move toward resilience improvement or resilience promotion. So what we are interested in doing in the Resilience Project is linking the social science constructs with neurobiological constructs across the lifespan and different cultural groups. It would be the first study of its type to attempt this. And I, I just show this uh, journal cover from uh, last September about where some of the science is headed. This is a, an issue that focuses, focuses entirely on the neurobiology of resilience. And so now I'm gonna go into a little bit about neuroscience. Uh, so try to bear with me uh, the next couple of slides. So what does neuroscience tell us? Well, Eric Nessler at uh, Mount Sinai and his uh, team uh, develop what's called the social defeat model, where a mouse is placed in physical contact with an aggressor mouse a few minutes a day 
Then the two are separated by a screen for the rest of the day, allowing there to be visual and sensory cues to occur between the two. The non-aggressor mouse shows behaviors interpreted as being stressed out, if you will, mouse PTSD. And this pattern is repeated for 10 days. Now, most mice exhibit behaviors viewed as compatible with depression and stress in humans, but a third of the mice do not, which has led to efforts to understand what makes them different. Resilient mice show an additional set of changes that seem to help them cope. So might vulnerability to stress be a failure of neuroplasticity? In other words, the ability of the brain and its function to respond in an adaptive way uh, to, to mitigate and push back on the effects of uh, kind of stress points. So, Global gene expression is different in resilient versus susceptible mice in the social de defeat model. So genes change up or down in mice. They change up or down in susceptible mice, but they change more in resilient mice. So it's not that resilient mice are not insensitive to stress, but they use more genes during stress. And getting into some of the mechanisms, in susceptible mice, dopamine neurons fire at higher rates in certain parts of the brain, but in resilient animals, the rate of firing is even higher, counterbalancing the pathogenic effects leading to quote-unquote normalization. So there seem to be clear neurobiological mechanisms that underlie resilience. And what might some of these mechanisms be? What controls neurobiological resilience? Just the fact that we can even be, be considering that concept is amazing. Uh, in, and it kind of underlines where the field is heading in our understanding of uh, such a basic concept as uh, resilience. So resilient animals, as you can surmise now, show greater adaptation in response to adversity. In active resilience, more genes are regulated in the dopamine system. It seems to be that the modulation, changing of potassium channels in certain parts of the brain of dopamine neurons appear to relate to which animals are resilient and which are susceptible. And these channels, these potassium channels, are believed to be active mediators of resilience. So the modulations of these channels can occur through potassium channel openers, agents that will actually allow more potassium to flow through these channels. So resilience, resilient mice use more ion channels, including actively regulating several potassium channels to stabilize dopamine neurons and counteract the pathologic dopamine hyperactivity seen in the susceptible subgroup. So additionally, promoting resilience mechanisms through use of potassium channel openers is believed to enhance resilience protection in susceptible mice. And I know this is uh, very technical and uh, I, I hope that uh, you, you take some of this away with you. So here's a kind of a flow diagram of susceptible mice. They're, they're, they experience stress. They're, they have potassium channel openers. Potassium flow is limited in the susceptible mice and it counteracts some of the, the brain hyperactivity. But in resilient mice, the potassium channel opener allows more potassium to flow through these openings in the potassium channels there's more effective counteracting of brain dopamine hyperactivity. And these mice become relatively unaffected. There is no mouse PTSD. So the new concept is that resilience is an active stress coping process through which resilient individuals maintain their health, healthy state through activation of more potassium channels. And the first open label trial on human subjects with depression using 
a new FDA approved anticonvulsive medication that targets, specifically targets potassium channels is underway at Mount Sinai. Now, are there other areas that scientists have been looking at? Well, in another study, mindfulness training has been shown to increase the structure of the hippocampus. And, and why is the hippocampus um, important? It is part of the brain that is engaged in storing long-term memories. It also is part of the hippocampus is involved in kind of, kind of uh, processing of navigation skills, spatial processing of navigation, finding one's way, uh, things like that. Mindfulness has also been explored and considered to be an anti-inflammatory agent, which is interesting. And probiotic ingestion, this gets into the gut microbiome, has been shown to alter cognitive function. So again, there are many different uh, areas that are being looked at that can shape and change how people respond to stress um, and uh, other uh, sources of adversity. So there are some individual characteristics that may be protective in face of adverse situations. And these are a high level of intellectual function, efficient self-regulation, active coping styles, a sense of optimism, secure attachment, more recently, maternal mental health shaping neurodevelopment in offspring, um, a difference between omega-3 versus omega-6 diets, socioeconomic status, maternal mental health has an effect on child development with effects, effects on IQ, cognition, pre-academic performance, vocabulary, numeracy, executive function, positive mood, and, and a sense of positive self, which gets into the role of public health. And individual behaviors that might be modified to promote resilience, optimism, cognitive reappraisal, active coping, social support, humor, physical exercise, pro-social behavior, mindfulness, and moral compass. And I give these lists because I'm going to tie these in to some of what the Resilience Project is interested in trying to do. Now, biomarkers, so this gets into the, back to the neurobiology, blood pressure, heart rate variability, hormones, immune function, genomics, uh, brain function, neuropsychological testing. Biomarkers will help connect the dots between neurobiology, physiology, and the social and psychological culture of resilience. If we want to know the extent and intervention to reduce stress works, for example, mindfulness, biomarkers would measure physiological stress before and after the intervention. Biomarkers for program evaluation measure indicators of change in resilience building interventions over time. So biomarkers are objective data that offer an evaluation tool other than self-reported data on feeling and behaviors, which do not always predict retrospectively which individuals will manifest pathology. Biomarkers help us understand the mechanisms through which risk and resilience have physiological and epigenetic signatures on the body. So there have been Rapid advances in neurobiology, I've shown you some of that today. Brain imaging, genetics, epigenetics, they hold great promise for opening up and understanding mechanisms of stress-related symptom development, as well as mechanisms of successful adaptation to and recovery from stress. A more complete understanding of underlying neurobiology may make it possible to identify pre-existing strengths and vulnerabilities to help us distinguish between and predict trajectories of symptom development and or resilience following stress and facilitate building specific skills designed to foster resilience. So 
we have three sites in the country, and I'm going to talk about the collaborate, collaborating team in a moment. The site in northeastern Pennsylvania, a site in the panhandle of Florida, looking at disadvantaged African American kids, and a site in Walla Walla, Washington. And here are the key elements, experts that are involved in the Resilience Project. Um, kind of my co-principal investigator is Michelle Batson Thompson, who's uh, associate professor at Florida State, where the uh, work in the panhandle of Florida is going on. The Resilience Improvement uh, is headed by Julian Ford, who's a colleague of mine from the University of Connecticut, uh, and Brooks Keishan, who's at the University of Utah. And joining them recently is uh, Fatima Wakil, who's associate professor in the new College of Health at Lehigh University. And we have a group in uh, California, uh, which is where I'm from, from, or spent many years there, on genomics, activity measures, and telemedicine, uh, a company uh, called With Health that will be providing the genomic testing, the activity tracking, uh, telemedicine uh, resources, and uh, some of the uh, neurochemical analyses that we'll, we'll be doing. Sean Eck, who's an Associate Dean for Research at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, whose area is in brain function and uh, fMRI. A number of people from Walla Walla, Washington, Ida Castro at the medical school, uh, focusing on diversity. Uh, two individuals who will be looking at um, resilience in older adults um, in the Geisinger Memory and Cognition Program here, and uh, Lisa Granville at Florida State University, and Peter Stewart, who's uh, at uh, Geisinger Wyoming Valley, uh, a neuropsychologist. And then we have, getting into the community resilience piece, we have Paolo Bocchini, who is Associate Professor of Civil Engineering, the uh, Chair of the uh, Department of Economics at Lehigh University. Uh, Dr. Chow. Uh, Dr. Korwer, who is the Vice President for Strategy and Planning and Vice Dean for Graduate Studies at uh, the School of Medicine here. Dina Davis, who's a Professor um, at Lehigh University and worked on the Human Genome Project. Brian Piper, who is an assistant professor who's also involved in bioethics. Project development, Nancy Lawton at Geisinger, IRB support, and so forth. A number of individuals, all of whom are uh, mid-level or senior people um, who have been attracted to this particular project because of the interest in resilience and the fact that this is at the cutting edge of uh, where things are developing. And then here are the list of kind of local colleges and universities that have expressed interest and want to be involved in this project. And I'm going to say a few words about how do these, which I view as kind of the jewels and gems of Northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, these, these uh, eight or nine institutions, uh, how do they come together uh, in the uh, resilience project? So linking the psychosocial aspects of resilience with the neurobiological across the lifespan, that is kids, adolescents, adults, older adults, that's going to generate uh, big data. So we plan to start in Scranton and the reasons for that as follows. With a population roughly around 70 to 75,000, an effort to introduce these concepts into a small city of this size is scalable. Could this be developed as a demonstration project for other areas of the country? Could the Resilience Project form a common interdisciplinary education and training system with multiple layers at undergraduate, graduate, and professional levels across multiple education and training systems? Could there be focused areas of expertise within the Resilience Project that would generate funding proposals from philanthropic state national funding sources that would support the broad and specific implications 
of this effort. This project is intended to be inclusive and as, as it develops its legs, extend uh, to other areas. So we think that we can arrive at a resilience score or resilience profile. Would this be comparable to temperature, pulse, and blood pressure? Would there be practical utility for such a metric? Would such a profile find its way into a person's health, school, or employment record? Would the profile have utility in helping an individual, educators, or employers have an understanding of where they might focus on improving the characteristics associated with the profile? Could this become part of education and occupational records so that educators and employers could target areas for individualized improvement in their educational and work settings? The process of individual resilience, resilience improvement is really resilience promotion. Could resilience improvement improve outcomes in disease states, reduce morbidity, and potentially reduce costs of healthcare? Could improvement in this area improve self-esteem, self-confidence, and success? How should communities be evaluated on community resilience improvement? Is there an index? And there, are, there is an index in some cities, in some countries. For communities, signs of success would be heightened internal solidarity, a sense of unity, healthy debate and deliberation, the utopian mood and overall sense of altruism, and the ability to involve oneself in heroic action when necessary. Resilience promotion leads to resilience improvement. It involves assisting to, assisting to develop, utilize, and strengthen capacities for coping, not only bouncing back from stresses, but growing and thriving. And the next step, as I mentioned earlier, would be vibrancy, the state of being full of energy and life as it applies to individuals and communities. So resilience promotion targets both formative and modifiable characteristics of individuals and communities. And here's a list of some of the things that we think uh, are involved in resilience promotion, health, self-esteem, sense of purpose, initiative, aspirations, values, intellect, relationships, emotional intelligence, family, community, society, safety, and so forth. Resilience promotion, again, individualized and community, kind of building and strengthening important concepts, secure attachment, self-regulation, executive function, socioeconomic equity. And I just threw in, consider that 45% of African-Americans in this region live at or below the federal poverty level. The goal of this, is to enable the individual to modulate biopsychosocial stress reactions to counter allostasis, that is, the breakdown of adaptive bodily and psychosocial functions, and to progress through phases of biopsychosocial development, achieve and sustain healthy functioning, and attain core life goals. Resilience promotion assist individuals and communities to develop, utilize, and strengthen capacities for coping. It targets both formative and modifiable individual characteristics. For example, health, self-esteem, sense of purpose, initiative, aspirations, values, and intellectual, relational, and emotional intelligence, and external pr protective factors in the family, community, and society that provide safety, security, affirmation, learning, and opportunities for meaningful achievement. So I go back to kind of throwing up this, uh, this uh, picture of all these various components, because if an area or if an individual is going to um, promote or engage in resilience promotion and resilience improvement, many of th these things need to be connected in some functional way. And, and that's, that's the challenge. So there are lists of things that resilient communities need to do. And here are 
10 things that the uh, Center for Sustainability and Economic Performance in the, from the Urban Land Institute listed. Understanding the vulnerabilities, so as, as I'm reading through this list, you can think about Northeastern Pennsylvania and how does this list apply to Northeastern Pennsylvania. Understanding vulnerabilities, strengthening job and housing opportunities, promoting equity, leveraging community assets, redefining how and where to build, building the business case, accurately pricing the cost of inaction, design in mind with natural systems, maximize co-benefits, and harness innovation and technology. I think it's a pretty good list. And I show this slide from, our, from Canada because I think this slide captures the difference between equality and equity. We're really after equity. And uh, this is about as clear a way as I've seen on how to define uh, what that concept consists of. So getting back to resilience science and academia, could resilience be led by higher education? Could the small colleges and universities in this region, along with the medical, medical school and it, its existing collaborators, Lehigh, Thomas Jefferson, Florida State, become a collective integrated academic engine to coordinate and investigate and integrate around the concepts of individual and community resilience for Scranton and extending to NEPA. And this collective could access projects in other national and international sites. Students at all levels could be involved in field work as the investigative workforce with multiple areas of concentration. Could the resilience project linking with business, justice, health, redevelopment, communication, religious, spiritual, really basically that list of all those, those areas that I said needed to be linked in some fashion, um, become an economic engine for the region, much in the way the Framingham Heart Study has been an economic engine in Massachusetts for the past 70 years. And here are the, the affinity groups that list of uh, kind of mid-level to senior people that I uh, showed before. These are the 12 areas that we call affinity groups where we want to have people engaged in each one of these areas and each area is developing on its own uh, concepts and ideas that could fit into an academic model and into a, a kind of functional delivery model. Uh, for communities and for individuals. So we're, we'll be doing this initial proof of concept work across the lifespan, uh, as, as I've said earlier, and we're going to consider a community-wide academic consortium that would identify approaches to resilience at individual and community levels. And we'll be looking at many of the things I've already mentioned in terms of the neurobiology and the psychosocial aspects. Proof of concept, 100 adults and older adults for this area. Um, again, going back to the original question, can Scranton become a community of resilience and can higher education lead it? Forming this collective integrated academic engine to develop a platform in resilience science at undergraduate, graduate and postgraduate levels. Should resilient science become a major field of study at undergraduate, graduate, pre-professional levels, mirroring the integration of psychosocial, neurobiological, economic, public health, and community science? Can the area's academic institutions come together as a collaborating, integrated collective, not as separate redundant entities, each doing the same thing, but similar to the key element panel groups, each with a unique piece of the project that is essential to the project's success? People in this area of study, in an area of study, could cross over into other area of institutions for courts and field work. Can the collective focus on resilient science while being applied to the population of Scranton and NEPA become a hallmark for the region? Now there's some ethical issues, and I'm gonna to try to stop in a few, couple of minutes. I've thrown a lot of information at you, I realize that but this is a complex project. There are ethical, legal, and social issues that are important to address. 
it is an exciting opportunity to push the boundaries of what we know about human flourishing and to benefit humanity in a number of ways. If we know more about what fosters resilience in the face of adversity, we can help people who are less resilient become more so. We can assist children in becoming resilient adults. We can design social, economic, and physical environments in ways that support resilience. But because resilience is an intuitively accessible concept, it is also easy for the public to adopt simplistic versions of a complex reality. Just as was seen with the Human Genome Project, there are dangers in resilience essentialism, essentialism and in forces that would use this research in discriminatory and non-beneficial ways. We don't want the result of this research to be used to give a free pass to the social environment. It's easier, easier to blame a lack of resilience than to address social issues such as poor schools or dangerous housing. Some people will try to misuse the research to blame the victim. For example, employers with unsafe or toxic environments might try to head off claims of comp for compensation by claiming that workers' injuries, for example, PTSD, were due to pre-existing condition or low resilience. It might be cheaper to try to identify and hire more resilient employees than to improve the work environment. We want to avoid genetic essentialism where people believe that their genes seal their fate we want to avoid resilience essentialism where people who identify as low resilience become convinced that they are doomed to certain negative outcomes. By the same token, while measuring resilience could prove to be powerful to help people achieve their full potential, it could also be used in stigmatizing and reductionistic ways. So we as researchers have an obligation to try to resist the use of resilience in faddish and simplistic ways. And I think these comments are really very important. So are there some signs that this is the right time for a project of this type? In England, grade school children are being taught mindfulness as an effort to shape the next generation in self-worth and self-sufficiency. In New Zealand, the prime minister has made well-being, that is resilience, a key priority for its citizenry and has put money behind it. In northeastern Pennsylvania, we have met with the people from Head Start and Early Head Start who help 1,500 children and their families who are very interested in what we are doing and would like to participate. We've been invited by the head of the Philanthropy Roundtable to present this project at its next meeting for consideration. And that meeting was to have been uh, this spring, but with COVID, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, in the same way, I had a meeting uh, scheduled with uh, Mayor Cognetti um, in early March but this, the week that that meeting was scheduled uh, with her, because I had sent her a notice, a, a note about this uh, concept, um, the meeting got canceled. I'm assuming that it will be rescheduled at some point. And we have an outline for a paper we believe health affairs might have interest in publishing. The proposed title, The Emerging Place of Resilience in Health, Healthcare, and Communities. We believe that this project, which is designed to enhance socialization, self-esteem, self-sufficiency and generativity across the lifespan can lower societal costs, lower healthcare costs, while improving uh, productivity and self-esteem and self-actualization. So these are, this last slide is just how we see resilient science connecting for individuals and for communities. Um, this is a complex uh, kind of multi-year, multi-generational uh, approach to, to try to take a look and take some action that will help improve both individual, uh, individuals and communities. So I'm going to end at, this, at that point and we have a few minutes for any questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Huey, for taking the time to go walk us through this. Um, I would <laughs> encourage everyone to please uh, send their questions to us through the chat. Um, you also have the opportunity to, if you want, would like to raise your hand to speak, um, you can do so by also using that uh, option you'll see, it'll say raise hand. Uh, you can feel free to do that or as mentioned, send it to us using the chat feature. Um, we do have a question um, here from, from Gus uh, Fahey. Um, he asked, does this effort need a marketing component? 
uh, what messages promote social support, exercise, pro-social behaviors, etc. Um, moving the community narrative from hard scrabble and individualistic to innovative and community centered. Well, I'm gonna go back to the uh, listing of the affinity groups here, the slide on the affinity groups. Uh, and you can say, see that the, uh, in the top line, the second affinity, affinity group involves communication, education, and training. So that's where the marketing piece would be. So, so for example, you know, when I say, well, what's the effect of corruption on the spirit of not just an individual, but a spirit of a community? Um, and I, the example that I gave when I, I've only been here a couple of years, but when I uh, have gone around and I've walked in the streets, I, I see a couple of things. I see uh, friendliness of people. I see people when I walk down the street and I don't know anybody, uh, they say hello to me. So I think that that's part of the friendliness piece that uh, goes into a resilient community. But I also see people um, uh, take, and the example that I've given in the past, take their ashtrays from their cars and dump it in the parking lot of the grocery store. And I think, well, what's that all about? And so that gets into uh, kind of the marketing and the psychology of resilience and, and respect for community. Um, and I, I tie that into the concept of corruption because if, if the, the feeling in a community is that historically, the political uh, establishment that it has been riddled with corruption, and I, I may be overstating it, I don't know, but um, certainly one cannot have helped look at the newspaper and you see the articles on corruption. Um, what does that do to individuals and to the sense of community and pride of community? So marketing about how do you change this? This gets into public health function, it gets into important areas such as smoking cessation, um, you know, activity and things like that. So yes, marketing is a big piece of this. Um, that's a long-winded answer to your question. Thanks so much. We have a few other questions that have come in. Um, one is from Owen Doherty, and I'm sorry, it might be Dr. D. Um, what do other community organizations need to do to become part of this effort? Well, they can contact me. Um, I, I can give you my email address. I, I hope you'll be hearing more about this at the community level uh, because I've been uh, discussing this and presenting this and you saw the list of uh, colleges and universities, uh, senior leadership at those institutions have expressed interest and want, want to be involved in this. And so what will that mean? What will that mean in the face of COVID? Um, I think that that remains to be determined. But it, it really is uh, trying to mobilize, as I said, the gems and jewels of uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania to become a collective and to see whether there can be connections made that will um, help uh, provide momentum for the development of, of this approach. And I think, you know, there are, there are issues that can be done in terms of uh, various age groups, school age kids, adolescents, uh, early and middle aged adults, older adults, there can be resilience promotion that get targeted for each one of those uh, particular groups um, to try to see whether we can kind of change what's going on with them. People who don't need to have any of that, they don't need to have any of that, but there may be people based upon um, their resilience profile that could, could benefit, may want to have uh, you know, some work or some intervention done to try to help them uh, kind of change their uh, appraisal of their situation. Uh, I mentioned the, the phrase cognitive reappraisal. That's a kind of a healthy adaptation that uh, psychologically can be quite meaningful and important for individuals, uh, kind of shifting their focus and their axis uh, to, uh, to consider other possibilities for themselves. We, we, we want this to be an inclusive project. We, we, we don't want to close the door to anybody uh, because as I said, community resilience really involves the community. And so, uh, you know, we look forward to working with organizations uh, that can help uh, span and, and, uh, and promote what it is that we're trying to do. 
we, we were going to go in for, you know, for the philanthropy roundtable for some funding. Uh, I want to go into uh, Robert Wood Johnson, a, a pioneer grant for seed funding for this resilient science concept to try to use some of some funds to uh, begin to kind of promote and, and uh, kind of develop connections among the small colleges and universities in this area uh, to, for, to, for us to begin to explore what are the connections that could exist. Um, and, and that would be a very exciting discussion to have. Thank you. Um, and a comment from Maureen is that uh, she says, this is a wonderful project for our region. She's a transplant here, moved back in, um, she moved here back in 2009. And the first thing she noticed was that hand dog attitude of local folks born and raised here. Um, they had a trouble understanding anyone choosing to move here and disparage the idea of our region um, that, you know, had anything attractive about it. So um, feels that this project could really realign that attitude of the population of the natives um, with the attitude of the transplants and uh, look, looking forward to participating with it. Um, and then there was a, an additional question about the role of arts in this project. Yes. What do you see the role of arts being? Well, I, I think that that's built into uh, the concept because I, I think that uh, on one of the slides I had, it mentioned something about uh, art architecture, uh, that gets into civil, uh, civil engineering, for example, uh, what are the components that, and that gets into vibrancy, you know, frankly. Uh, so all of that is very important in terms of how do you, how do you not just uh, work to, to move toward a resilient community, but how do you make a resilient community vibrant um, and, and interesting and exciting? Uh, so when I talk about, uh, why are there truck routes that are that go through the middle of uh, cities? For example, Scranton. Why is there a truck route that runs through the middle of Scranton? Um, you know, and I and I have nothing against trucks. So, but I have questions that uh, that come to me about well, what what's the effect of that on a city? Now, there may be maybe because there's no other way to do it, or why is there a truck route that runs through uh, Clark Summit? Uh, I don't understand that. Um, where are the green spaces? And I'm aware of pocket parks being developed in Scranton, which I think is great. But where are the green spaces? Because there, there's literature about green spaces actually promoting a sense of well-being in populations. And um, if we're talking about well-being, uh, you know, so green spaces are important. Um, and that list, the 10 things that come from the urban uh, uh, development uh, group, those 10 things are really quite interesting and, and how communities and how organizations approach what they're doing relative to those 10 items, um, I think would be an interesting thing for organizations to consider. Um, you know, these slides can be available to you. I, I think that the, you know, that's perfectly fine because as I said, this is totally inclusive. We wanna have people involved and engaged. Um, um, excellent, thank you. And um, we want to be cognizant of everyone's time that we have uh, we have exceeded the hour. That said, there are two more questions. We do understand if other people do have to to uh, jump off the call, but we'll just go through these really quick. Which are they're they're all all in the same vein. You know, how does one become a member of the hundred persons involved in the study? And someone else asking. Many organizations are frozen during this pandemic, but believe that there is groups who are willing to change. And how do we capitalize this? How can we help? So I think. Um, you know, we could certainly get into, you know, what um, your ideas are. I will say we will be sending out the survey um, for your information. If you have a particular interest in getting involved, I can share out um, Dr. Huey's uh, contact information. Or if you have a specific interest, you can also feel free to uh, respond via the survey or even my email out to the group um, expressing your interest or groups that you think might be interested and I can get that information over to him. So, um, if this is something explicitly that you want to get involved in, you know, we can make that happen. Yeah, no, that's very, very much, uh, acceptable, Maggie. The other thing I will, will mention, uh, at the Psychology of Return to Work, uh, some, uh, webinar on June 12th, I mentioned a survey, if, if there were people interested, uh, in having a brief anonymous survey, uh, given to their employees or their members who are re returning to work or in the process of returning to work. If anybody is also interested in that survey, um, we, that survey is actually uh, 
in the process of being distributed now. So if you want to have uh, any information about your organization or people who are returning to work, that will uh, provide some information in that particular area as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, I'm actually going to stop the recording here uh, with a thank you so much for taking the time, uh, Dr. Huey, for going through this uh, information. I think it's really fascinating. It's going to be a wonderful resource for this area, and it's exciting to hear that kind of that Scranton is is going to be able to be the support area in this. So, I want to thank you very much uh, for that. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me, Maggie.